Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the fourth tutorial session in the last session today. And my name is Mo. I'm a PhD student in applied math in Professor Johnson's group. So in this session, I'll talk, talk about inverse designing a meta lens surface, a meta surface lens. So it's also used the MIP adjoin code. So you'll know this kind of code is similar to what Alec just presented. So let's just start. Yeah. So just give uh, uh, everyone a little background. So uh, Mahal lens is basically a thin structure that has some sub wavelength. Um, a, a thin film has a uh, sub wavelength structure that can modulate, modulate the light. So in particular, we want to design, in, in this tutorial, we want to design a lens that can focus the incident light, incident light uh, onto a focus far away. So this example is, uh, basically the same, uh, yeah, it's similar to the, um, the example we have in this paper, like right down here, somewhere. Yeah, it's a similar example. And the reason I really like the example is it has like three key components, cylindrical coordinate, it uses cylindrical coordinates to do a three technical 3D design. And second is use a near to far transformation so that we only need to focus on smaller cell rather than a, a large uh, simulation cell. And third is use the epigraph formulation, uh, which allows us to optimize several quantities simultaneously. So each of these components, I believe are, uh, are important and useful. So regardless of whether you're doing your design or not. So, and this example will just have all of them all these components and also it's doing a university side. So any questions at this point? Okay. So syndrome coordinates. Um, basically, if we are designing a 3D structure, but we have some continuous rotation symmetry, then the fields is basically can be expressed, uh, the uh, angular dependency of the field can be taken out as the exponential form. So e to the im phi basically. And so all you need to do in MEEP to set this up is to change the dimensions to cylindrical and choose an integer m. And another thing uh, is just, you'll be working in syndrome coordinates. So just make sure you like, you need to interpret every like coordinates uh, in terms of r, phi, and z instead of x, y, z. And also the few components will be uh, in R, Phi, and Z instead of uh, X, Y, and Z. So um, let's uh, look at the code. Uh, so yeah, here are some doc So here are some documentations about the cylindrical symmetry just in general. And also it has many nice examples already. And in particular, let's look at like Michael here. So yeah, aside of the all the import, I'm guessing you're all familiar with and this basic setup, you should notice that we're now specifying things in like R and Z. So in particular, uh, for Z in the Z direction, we have like PML on two sides, it's top and bottom. But for the in R direction, in the radial direction, we only need to add PML like on one side because it will be rotated all around. And moreover, when you look at the source, like is where it where it is, it will be inside. Let me actually show a picture. Yes, so basically this is the thing we want to set up. You want to specify everything in terms of single coordinates, like the source will be here, basically the center in it will be this point here, and you specify the size of this entire in, in the radial coordinates. And similarly for the design region and sub, and you should and you can see this PML goes around it, but then have the side on like on the right, I guess. So uh or the or the left, yeah, on the left. So basically it will be rotated around. So it looks you, you need to basically interpret everything in terms of this picture. And as a comparison, we have a Another tutorial example. So this is the metal lens in 2D. And you can see this has a PML all around it, right? And this goes from like negative to the positive x-axis, right? But in single corner, we only have like kind of half of it. 
And uh, another thing is about the components I just talked about. So when you specify the source, like instead of like EX and EY or EZ, you need to use like ER or EP or EZ. And um, let's see. And yeah, and that's, oh, and finally, as I said, so you need to specify the dimensions as the need cylindrical and you pass in the integer M. So that's, that's all the trick you need to do to run the simulation in the cylindrical coordinates. Uh, any questions at this point? Cool. And so in particular, um, it's, it's, this is also included in one of these examples, uh, maybe. Yes, so if you want to do a linearly polarized uh, polarize the plane wave, you can do that in central coordinates. It's basically, you need to uh, launch two simulations with uh, N plus and negative one, and need to superimpose them somehow. And um, basically, yeah, uh, this is expression that decompose the ER and um, it decompose EX polarization in terms of uh, ER and uh, phi, and you can do a similar thing for the Y polarization. And you can go over this example for a detail like how it's done, but it's basically the idea I just talk about. Okay, so so with the uh, syndrome coordinates, uh, with using this rotational symmetry, we can just originally our metal lens is a three D lens, right? Uh, in principle, but since we're exploring a uh, continuous symmetry, rotational symmetry, we just basically can just slice. Right now, so it's hugely, it already hugely reduced the simulation. The next thing is the near to far transformation. So Arwen mentioned a little bit about this uh, this morning. So um, basically, if uh, you have some cell right in the near region and you had you can everything like all the physics happening inside, and if you're interested in the far field, you can just you don't need to. Uh, include the, you don't need to create a large simulation cell that include the far field. You can just use a small simulation cell and you need to specify near to far regions. Basically, it will transform. It will take the, it will accumulate all the fields on the near region and it will use the analytical Green's function to uh, find the compute the field at far point, at any far point like you want. So the, the key point here is that near to far, uh, it's used an analytical formula, right? So it assumes that uh, it's, it should be in the homogeneous and isotropic material so that the transformation is correct. And also in principle, it should capture like all outgoing waves, all, <clears throat> all going waves. But in practice, like you can only specify the, you only need the region that captured the by propagating the direction of your far, far field points. So again, like there are many documentations already exist, just uh, and examples about near to far. Just the, this is about the forward near to far trans, uh, near to far transformation. Okay. Sure, yeah. I mean, I'll, the, 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 the slides will be available anyway later, and they can just. Uh, yeah, uh, so, so yeah, so uh, I'll put the, the link up to this. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so, so Fred Jensen will be putting all this link in the chat and uh, you'll be able to access them, or you can just wait until the slides will be available and. Uh, yeah, it will be, just to be clear, it will be in the chat, not the Q&A. Okay, so. Uh, so, yeah, so I was talking about the neutral part transformation. This is just neutral part transformation in general. And in our inverse design, so we not only want to do the calculate forward, the neutral far, we also care about the edge joint or its gradient. So basically, since we already have the analytical formula for that, it's basically a back propagation step, and we already implemented. So we only we, so for the adjoint calculation, we also only need a small cell, then and we don't need to include the far point far away. And uh, again, let me show the examples in my code. 
specifically in here. So yeah, so to, to use the near to far in the ad drawing, you basically specify the far points. So it can it should be a list, like you have as many points as you want. And then you have a list of neutrophile regions. Again, in our case, it only has one neutrophile, this blue line. It captured because the wave is the red line that's going up and the blue line will capture all the all going waves in our desired direction. So we only specify like one design region. And then we just pass in this, create this MPA neutrophile fields. And that will create the that will that will be the argument you pass in later on into this optimization problem, and uh, here is the actual optimization problem. The the value we're interested. So since we're creating a focus, we want to maximize the intensity. So I'm using a negative sign here because I'm using an attribute formulation. I'll talk about that later. But uh, for now, so you should notice that the near to far, uh, the far fields has is a three dimensional, uh, three dimensional array. The first axis corresponds to the far, the, the index of your far point. So since you only have one, it's just zero. And the last axis is correspond, corresponds to components. So like zero, zero, one, two, three, four, five corresponds to EX, EY, EZ, and HX, HY, and EZ. HC and cylindrical coordinates, those uh, X and Y automatically will be interpreted as um, uh, R and row, R, R, R and P, basically. So, yeah. Uh, and also, this is a vector values uh, function. Again, I'll mention that in the Africa formulations. So, there's some tricky things here, but I think there are some questions. It's, no. Okay. Any questions? So, okay. Okay. Cool. Uh, great. So, so yeah, as I just mentioned, so originally we would have a large cell in three D that encompass our like design and the sources and also our focus point. And right now we can just reduce it to just a slice in 2D and it's only uh, really short in the Z direction that allows us we have the, the near to far region that will do the transformation for us. And yeah, I think this is a pretty clear picture of what we do. And you can compare that to the, the original, like originally we have like large cell Right, and this will be 3D, but we just reduced to like tiny little bit. Okay, so another thing about um, this optimization is we're actually trying to focus on two frequencies, or in general, we can add more frequencies, but as a tutorial example, I'll just do a focus of two frequencies. So the point is, Originally, we want to, uh, so when we're talking about optimizing several quantities simultaneously, it normally means that we want to maximize the worst case performance. So like maximize or the design variables of the minimize, the, the minimal value of all the, uh, the sets <clears throat> of functions. And mathematically, this is equivalent to just adding a dummy variable, let's call it T, and we maximize both X and T. And we add a constraint that T will be less than all the FIs, basically. So that's called the Afterground formulation. Um, it makes the original maximum function, which is not the differentiable function, to a differentiable function that we can actually optimize, which just adding a one actual dummy variable. So these are like mathematical equivalents. So the and to do that in the ad joint, uh, in the ad joint, is so you still have the uh, op silver here set up here, which I just showed, and you have uh, this objective function. You pass in you choose an object function and the inequality, the uh, inequality constraint functions, and for inside those definition functions, 
So you should notice that for the objective function, it just depends on the dummy variable T here. It does not depend on any of the design variables. And this gradient will just be one for T and will be zero for everything else, right? Since our objective function is just T. And for the constraints, it's the other way. Uh, oh, I should uh, probably, yeah, I should mention this first. So, our optimization function will, uh, so uh, you know, our optimization will just be this form will minimize t such that t will be uh, greater than the negative value of all the e phi at all at the, the focus point, which I choose to be at z equals 20, and at this two frequencies omega one and omega two. And this a uh, a equals B is just the Maxwell equation. So we will take, uh, so the adjoint solver will take the derivative of this function such, uh, subject to the constraint that it satisfies the Maxwell's equation. So yeah, and so, and that's why we're, it's, it's actually a little different than uh, max, uh, max mean is like mean max, but since we're using the negative values, so it's the same thing. And, um, so let's look at the code again. So with that in mind, you should notice that we're minimizing the, ob the objective function will be a minimizer and it's just T. And for the constraints, it will be like the function minus T. So the gradient with respect to T is just negative one and the gradients for everything else will be calculated from the adjoint solver. So the thing with L op is, so you should remember that the object function has to be a scalar because if it's a vector, it doesn't really make sense. As I said, you should really should use the apicard formulation because that's really uh, what you mean when we try to optimize simultaneous several quantities, right? But the constraints can be a vector valued function and L op supports that. You just, I think for scalar constraint, you just, uh, inequality constraint and for uh, inequality constraints, uh, I mean, for for scalar values constraints, just inequality constraint and for vector value, you just add the M here. And this just corresponds to the, um, uh, our function here we defined earlier, it will be a vector value function. And we want this one minus T to be less than zero. And then you calculate, you need to calculate the so, uh, um, yeah, and for L ops, so there are two gradients uh, uh, here. Actually, one is for the gradient inside the L ops. So that's actually a Jacobian, right? It's a vector value function, so it's a Jacobian. And the other gradient is the uh, gradients from the output by the optimization problem. So that's taking the derivative of this function. So. If you have multiple objective functions, I mean, in terms of the, um, yeah, you have multiple uh, objective functions. So this quantities, this, uh, or, uh, this Jacobian will be like, um, uh, each row corresponds to like a different objective function and each column corresponds to different design variable. But for, an L, uh, for, for the adjoint actually it's different the output, the DJDU here will actually be in terms of all the OBA matrix that where all the rows, each row corresponds to different design variable and each column corresponds to a different frequency because it uses the frequency domain. So it, it transforms, it has a Fourier transform that basically look at the frequency domains. So that's why uh, here in our objective functions can have a, each component of that vector can be, it can be a vector and it can have, um, uh, it must have different frequency dependencies for the uh, MIV adjoint to correctly calculate its gradient. And then you need to do some further um, uh, post-processing to correspond that to your optimization function. I don't know if I probably not, uh, let me uh, rephrase it another way. So 
for example, so here we only have two frequencies, right? And this will be a vector value, then each component corresponds to one frequency. So inside for the gradients that you pass to the NL opt, it well, you do the tensor decoding product as you, you always is a back, uh, as a back propagation from filtering and projection, right? And then you take the components corresponds to the uh, individual frequencies and do the back propagates. That will be the actually that turns out to be the same function, the same gradients for the uh, of your Jacobian pass into the you know, opt. If some, if for example you have something like uh, if you have like more more frequencies and if you have, for example, uh, you have like you look at the first uh, two frequencies, the first two frequencies, and you have another uh, say. Um, Look at the uh, th uh, third frequencies here. So you can do something like that here. So notice that this each component of this vector has have to depend on different frequencies. Like they, they can't have any overlaps. And then this output DJDU from uh, from opt from Mivadron will have three columns basically, like one for each frequency. And then you need to post-processing that so that it will correspond to the actual function. So for example, here, it will be like the, the first, uh, it will be more like uh, the, the first row of the, oh, but by the way, so it, we do the transpose here. So the first column here will be the sum of like the first two, it will be a, a sum somewhere. Uh, or, yeah, let me write this side. So, and then you need to have a second line that will do, that will calculate the Jacobian entry for the second row, which will be, uh, we will just have the second frequency at uh, the third frequency. So now, so this gradient corresponds to the actual here, but it's not the same as the output from, uh, uh, from not, I'm sorry, uh, not from the adjoint. So I don't know if I'm clear on that. So it basically this no I have here. So I don't know if I'm clear on that. Any questions? Okay. And so the actual optimization will run for hours, like I run it on 16 processes and it will take uh, a couple of hours of four or five hours. And, but you can see the actual structures here. Like I run the, I run the simulation in a larger cell to include the focus point. And you can see it like it will nicely focus like at both wavelengths onto that point, like at 20. So that's, uh, that's basically it it's about the inverse design of the uh, matter surface. It will be, it's in the paper, the focus was at 30, and I think was at different frequencies, but it's the same idea. You just, some parameters you can play with, right? And uh, as I mentioned, there's, there exists uh, 2D, Metal lens optimization is also focusing metal lens at two frequencies. And you can also check that out. But that's in two again, this is cylindrical coordinates. So, yeah. So, I have some additional slides prepared that's about other features in MIF adjoint. I can go over them or if, yeah. Um, for your metal lens, you have the two frequencies. Yeah. Is it a broadband response or is it? Well, it's, it's specifically targeted at those two. Oh, I'm sorry. So the question was, uh, was this a broadband optimization or a specific target at those frequencies, right? So for this example, I specific target at those frequencies. So it's guaranteed to work well at those frequencies. Is I haven't tested in any frequency within that range. So, yeah. Right, it probably won't. So, yeah, Alec. 
Cylindrically, oh, thank you. Can you hear me, Mo? Yep. So I know you do a lot of cylindrically symmetric optimization case, but I also know you do a lot of full 3D optimization, right? Yep. Um, what are some of the distinguishing features between the two? Can you comment on that? Well, well, I tried 3D uh, just a while ago, and um, basically 3D will take longer time, as you guess, and uh, it will be uh, it will has a more hard degree of freedom and um, actually haven't got any results from 3D yet. So, but I would assume it will do better, I guess. But in our, my, my product has like a lot of other constraints that make it like really stiff. So I, I'm not sure about that yet. But in general, if you have a 3D, it will have more, um, it should perform better, right? Then, yeah, but then in 3D, you, you can uh, impose other symmetries, like mirror symmetries, to also reduce the computational cell and the cost. So, yeah. Yeah. So you were talking about the full 3D where it's. There you're talking about full 3D where it's volumetric degrees of freedom, like for 3D right. printing, yes. as opposed to 3D where you just have 2D degrees of freedom. Right. So we, right, we should, yeah, we, 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 we've also done that that kind of thing as well. Yeah, yeah, that, that, right. that's what I was talking about. Like the full uh -huh. 3D degree of freedom. Like I have, you have a design region that's like have X, Y, and Z. So yeah. So in, in general, you gain uh, you gain more by having multiple levels of degrees of freedom, make like depth degrees of freedom than you do uh, in, in plane. Um, so that the best is if everything, if you have full 3D, 3D volumetric degrees of freedom, um, but uh, you know, this, uh, uh, this kind of, uh, you know, depth of uh, the structure where there's multiple layers of, of degrees of freedom are, is probably better than a structure where you only have a single layer metasurface. Yeah. So yeah. the performance of single layer metasurfaces is pretty, pretty limited. But of course, this one doesn't have any fabrication constraints yet. In it. Right, I didn't impose any fabrication constraints. Yeah, so um, first question is, how do we know a priori that it may not work well in between wavelengths? Well, we're not sure. It's just, uh, this is specific targets. Okay. That those okay. Issues, so. <laughs> okay. Um, the, the second question is, uh, I'm thinking of a specific uh, problem where I, I want to couple into predefined spatial modes okay. at some distance above the surface. Um, Okay. But there may be a number of spatial modes, and I would like to couple into them equally efficiently. Okay. Is that, that seems like that's manageable with their, yeah. Your, uh, yeah. Your I constraint mean, constraint functions seem like you just keep them. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, I mean, the mass problem. Yeah. But, yeah. In this case, it's more the application I'm thinking of is more important to keep all of the coupling efficiencies as close as possible as opposed to just overall maximizing the total efficiency. So, I, I need to see each mode equally well because of yeah, the, basically, uh, yeah, yeah, that, that's the point of the this, right? You want to yes, make them exactly. equally well. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, what does the shape of your um, monitor look like? Are you using some kind of mode, or is it just no? Is it? It's just uh, we're just specifically. Uh, do, is that your question, or? Yeah, is it like the pointing flux or the power? No, it's uh, the near too far uh, field. So, um, so is, is there a so mode we, we overlap? So we just in specifically or? like targeting the field intensity at that point. Okay. So if you look at the code, uh, it's just so that this was this near too far field does it it collects the fields at the near region and will just analytical compute the far fields like the the field itself basically and. Um, or, and I'm specific, of, I changed the color a little bit, but I'm specifically trying to maximize the field intensity at that point. So it's not a mode or anything. Yeah, just a square. So yeah, it's uh, I have here. Um, yeah, just the e square. I see. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that polarization at two frequencies at this point. Yeah, Havoc. So there's 
Yeah, uh, so yeah, I guess I can. Yeah, so uh, yeah, the, the polarization is here. So it's just when define source, you define the component, right? Just it's just the same thing as in you know 2D or 3D, you define the component, the polarization of that. So you can change that to like ER to be a radio polarized thing or. Yes. Just to be clear, the question was, you know, does it radially polarized or cylindrically polarized? So radially polarized would correspond to a field outwards that would be m equals zero, right? If it's right, yeah. uh, uh, um, so, if here you have m equals one, and so right, so yeah, what, what you, so what you're circular. putting in is, is what's called circularly polarized, yeah. right? So and of course linearly polarized is just the superposition of two of these. Yep. Yeah. Um, but since the structure is symmetric, if, if it's optimi optimized for left circularly polarized, it's also optimized for right circularly polarized, which means for any, any, any combination. So it also works equally well for linearly polarized in any direction. Right? So, so it's sufficient to optimize just for one circular polarization uh, in, in, in this kind of system. But you could also do radially polarized or cylindrically polarized, you know, the, the different types of field patterns, but those would correspond probably also to different M's. Um, and Alec. So I have more of like a feature request comment that relates to what we were talking about earlier. Oftentimes, with the near-to-far transform, we want to do further computations on uh -huh. the fields themselves in the far field. Um, one example would be a mode overlap, right? And right now we could do that brute force, or we could even use the autograd interface to do that. Yeah. Um, but it might be nice if we think about incorporating built-in eigenmode overlaps or maybe some other fundamental features. Yeah, of course. Yeah. With the near-to-far. Yeah. So you have a couple more slides introducing other features of me if I've joined. If there's no more questions. Yeah, like, yes, so first first of all, um, I like mentioned about eigenmode and I talk about near to far fields, but there are other supported the differentiable quantities in MIFAD drawing. So specifically at LDAS, uh, which is basically the field the, the, at the power expanded by source and also the Fourier fields. So uh, the parentheses here is the size of this quantities or the shape of this quantities. So remember like when you specify the organization problem, you specify the argument, right? And you need to know the size of it or just the shape of it. So you can just multiply, uh, manipulate those quantities. In particular, so for eigenmode and LDOS, it's just, it's an array just at each frequency of interest. And, uh, for near to far, as I mentioned, it's a 3D array. The first axis is the points, and second is the kind of frequency, and the third is the components. And for the Fourier fields, so mostly the components specified when you define the Fourier fields is here. So the return was just be frequency by points, and this points is basically specify a volume here, and, and after this validation, it contains like all the points here, and that's what's returned, and it will, the four fields will just return the, will find the fields, in ten, the, the four fields at those points. So uh, generally it's more like if you want to try to do some integral over that surface, that volume. So that's something you can use for fields. And you just be like sum of uh, frequency and corresponding frequency and points at those and, and some other stuff. So yeah, so this is any question about this slide? Okay, and next, uh, a few tricks and tips like for doing organization in MIFI drawing. So first of all, it's very important that you should check to make sure the gradient is correct. And by that, I mean, uh, so we have a tutorial examples that basically is called checking the uh, gradient gradient and compared to the fine difference gradients. So you should ideally see that they should align. So you should try that like for your setup and just make sure the gradient is correct. So sometimes, I mean, because it's we're continuing developing it and there might be some corner cases that we miss. So it would be a good idea to check that before you actually do the organization because you know, it really relies on the correct gradient information. 
So yeah, checking gradients is very important. And here the code for checking gradients is it's very well explained here, but basically we have already have a calculate find diff, find different gradient function. And just it will choose the you just specify points and will randomly choose, like for example, here 10 points, and this is the step size for the find difference gradient. And then you compare this uh, the output, the G discrete with the adjoint gradient here, and just make sure they, they align. So that's the first like important advice. And second, I want to mention that the initial gas, like for your optimization problem, you need to have an initial gas for that, right? And that can be very important. So, so first of all, if you have a lot many constraints, you should make sure that initial gas is in the feasible region. So is it, if it's not feasible region, then the, there's no guarantee what the optimization, optimization will output. So, and also it's, it would be good if like your initial gas, you have some rough idea what it would look like. So you make that as your initial gas and the optimization will build on that. So yeah, that's the point of initial gas. And third is an artificial loss. So this is basically we are, well, yeah, there are two things actually about the loss, but um, where is it? Here, yeah, so basically it's, it's for the, the, this artificial loss term is when you want to binarize, you really want to binarize your structure, right? And there's a beta term that do the projection that will binarize the term, binarize the structure. But sometimes if you really want it to be binarized like really quickly, we can have a penalty term that for intermediate values, right? This term, this is a conduct, like a fake artificial conductivity that only, only works if like only it's only active if the value is not zero or one. So the, all the intermediate values and will be a big, basic fake damping term that will really penalize the intermediate values and will really help to binarize the structure. So, and meanwhile, so there are some other examples that, you know, for example, if you're optimizing LDOS and adding a loss in general, like not, not this artificial, uh, conductivity in intermediate for intermediate values, just an overall conductivity in the simulation. If you add some, so I mean that when you're optimizing LDOS, for example, add some overall conductivity would be helpful. Like you gradually decrease that conductivity, decrease that loss. So basically the point is to like smear out the, the, the frequency. So yeah, any questions on this slide? Okay, so finally, uh, I'll just briefly talk about the um, fabrication constraints. So, so I think they are like highly desired. There's the, we have the geometric constraints, Alec also mentioned a little bit. So it's, it's we have, uh, we can constrain on the, why? Yes, it supports, basically you can constrain the length scale and the uh, constraint on the void. And this is, it has some examples syntax here. And also, and the gradient is just by autograd. So this grad is from autograd. It will automatically find the gradient of this constraints. And another thing is connectivity constraints and it's still in progress, but we have this, basically we have a similar features. Like normally you want your structure to be connected, right? So we have some constraint like that and I'm still working on that. So we have one, it's not working perfectly yet, but uh, keep working on that. But it will be a similar syntax. Basically it will specify uh, the region and you want to have the connectivity and you'll just calculate the, gra the gra gradient. So basically this connectivity assumes that the structure, you want the structure to be connected to one of the boundaries of your design. So makes it closely, so mostly if you have a supporting layer or something and you all structures on top of that layer. So that's these connectivity constraint. So I think uh, that's everything. And it's just a picture of all of us, so <laughs> yeah. Hey Mo, I really liked your talk. Um, I was wondering for the meta lens, yeah. if the input field is at a different angle, will it also work? Pretty well, or is it similar to the frequency problem? Or well, it's not, again, it's not all, all like targeting that, but okay. you can do that. Like 
you can just a different organization problem, right? And also, I think Eric also mentioned something like that. If you want something more robust, you can, it's also minimax where you try all different scenarios and optimize the worst case scenario. So, yeah, but again, for this case, it's not specific targeting or different incidents or something. Okay. We do have a paper. So we do have a paper where we, we optimized a cylindrical structure for multiple angles and multiple frequencies at, at a, and it's again sampling discrete angles and discrete frequencies, but it samples them finely enough that uh, that basically works for all the angles and frequencies in between. So it's a full plan acromat structure. So that that that's certainly possible to do. Uh, in cylindrical coordinates, it, it, it is a little bit more tricky. As soon as you come, uh, so normal incidence is just m equal a single simulation, m equals one. But if you want to come off at uh, do a cylindrical simulation for off normal incidence, you, you have to do what's a, what's called a Jacobi anger expansion, which is described in our paper. I mean, it's a standard thing to expand uh, a plane wave off angle in the basis of, cylind of cylindrical waves. So then you need to actually do several cylindrical calculations at different M's and, and add them up. But you can, we can do that, put them all together, do it in cylindrical coordinates and, and do a minimax over angle and frequency and get something that works for, for everything. Mo, do you wanna make a comment about maybe one day supporting mode coefficients in cylindrical coordinates? Yeah, I think so. Uh, I think like, uh, the central coordinates, like there's the code will be slightly different if we like try to count the gradients in central coordinates and in 2D. And I think that part is already worked out. So I think everything that's already supported in 2D will be supporting cylindrical. And if anything can be supporting 2D, we'll be able to support in cylindrical. You know, doing a model decomposition in cylindrical coordinates is fundamentally it's the same math. It's just that right now, MEEP as its mode solver uses MPB, which does not support cylindrical coordinates. So, um, so you would need a cylindrical mode solver, or I guess you could do a full 3D mode solve and then, you know, and then project out the modes you want, but that'd be a little bit expensive. Um, but see, see, in principle, it's, it's doable, but we need to plug in a different mode solver. Okay, so unless there's any further questions, I think we can, we can uh, thank the speaker again and, and uh, close for the session for the day.